Hello and welcome to this repair tutorial and today we're going to look at a Cambridge Audio and the model number is P500 and as you can see that this is an audio power amplifier meaning that it doesn't have an integral pre-amplifier that would normally be sold as a separate unit and if you purchased it at the time and this is around the year 2000 Cambridge Audio provided the C500 General specifications RMS power output power is 55 watts into 2 times 6 ohm speaker loads and depending on the input impedance of your speakers, you could have a range up to a maximum of 16 ohms, but probably the most common being 4 or 8 ohm speakers. Input sensitivity is 650 millivolts, and the input impedance is 47 kilo ohms. And frequency response is 10 hertz to a maximum of 70 kilohertz. Overall harmonic distortion is 0.02% and weight 6.7 kilograms and dimensions height 90 millimeters by a width of 430 and then the depth being 300 millimeters. Now the customer contacted me via the YouTube channel and what the customer advised for the amplifier was that the, there didn't appear to be any audio output on either of the channels. So when you look at this photograph here you're just looking from the top of course with the cover removed and what you'll find is there's quite a lot of empty space the reason for that is what Cambridge Audio have done is they've removed the tone control board and also the input selection board which would normally occupy the remaining chassis space that you see here and then if you bought the C500 the preamplifier then you would see those boards fitted but the power amplifier would not be installed and then you can see at the rear just towards the right hand side this is where you have your RCA input connectors and the dual left and dual right channel and they go directly or connect directly then to the power amplifier board. So as we said, you don't have any tone control circuits. And just on the left hand side, what you can see is the toroidal transformer. Uh, towards the rear is where you have the input power coming in. And then just to the left hand, towards from fascia, that has the power switch on there. There's also a power protection fuse. And you also see a drop-in resistor, which we'll sort of speak about a little bit later on in the tutorial. And also on the power amplifier module, just where it comes off the toroidal, you'll find that there are two protection fuses on there. Now, what was the issue with the amplifier? Well, the customer had already removed the top cover and had already identified that there appeared to be a burnt out resistor. And that's what we're looking at here. R214 is a 270 ohm resistor, and that's the one just on the left, closest to the small electrolytic capacitor. The one in the center, which appears to be burnt out, that is 100 ohms. And then R212, which is the one just to the right, the resistance value of that should be 22 kilo ohms. If you desoldered the ends of all of those three resistors and just did a resistance check, what you found was that R213 was open circuit, but also 212 was also higher resistance than what it should have been. R214 was fine, that's a 270 ohm resistor. So to actually remove or to lift up the board, what you have to do is to remove, remove the rear fixing screws. These are the ones which connect through to the speaker terminals. And then you'll also find underneath that you have eight screws which screw through the bottom plate and then connect to the heatsink. And then there's two fixing posts which are like brass. So here what you can see is that the board has been lifted up and then when you rotate it over, here you can see the solder side. And this is something you need to do if you're working on any of these amplifiers. You'll often find that due to heat or maybe lack of solder during manufacturing that you get a lot of dry joints. And then you can see then they're sort of grey and maybe in some case you get a crack just around where the connection lead for the component comes through and then soldered onto the board. So always best practice, just check those joints and then just reflow them then with fresh solder. And then here on the next photograph, what we show you is those resistors replaced. So R214, as we said, that's your 270 ohms. There's R213, brand new 100 ohm quarter watt resistor fitted. And then your 22K ohm is R212. So once that was done, then the next part really is to carry out some additional work. And the reason for that is because of the age of the amplifier. What you see now are the four power output transistors. So these are the SAP15N and SAP15P Sanken audio output transistors. Now, if you go into forums and you're sort of doing any search around like the Cambridge A5, P500, etc., a common thread tends to come about concerning the size of the heatsink, saying that it was underrated and that was often the reason for the 
failure of the output transistors. In this case, it wasn't that the output transistors had failed, but this is always best practice to do. So once you remove the fixing screws and just raise the power transistors up, what you can see on the on the rear of the transistor is really a lack of what we call thermal transfer grease. And that thermal transfer grease just allows correct heat transfer between the rear of the power transistor. So this is internally on the substrate back to the metal casing. And then what should happen is the heat sink compound then should transfer via and they look like transparent plastic washers, but these are actual mica insulators because the rear of the power transistors electrically are not isolated. So you have to have an isolation with the metal heatsink. And you should have good thermal transfer compound, both where the mica washer attaches to the heatsink and to the rear of the power output transistors. Now, if you didn't remove the fixing screw and you just looked, you might see a little bit of the white thermal transfer compound. But as soon as you remove the bolts and lift them up, what you'll find is that the, it's almost like a chalky and what's happened is it's just dried out over the decades of use and you have to replace it now it's a job which probably takes about 15 20 minutes to do all the transistors but what you then do is if you put the new thermal transfer compound on there you're just really improving the energy efficiency you know how quickly can that heat dissipate away from the power transistors and it also gives you that thermal uniformity and all i simply do here is i just wipe off all of the old thermal transfer grease both from the rear of the transistor also from the mica washers both sides and also from the heatsink and then apply new grease and then here what you can see is that task has now been completed the transistor's back mounted fixing bolts in place so once that was done, as with any amplifier repair that comes into the workshop it's not just a case of just fixing the issue what you need to also take care of is any additional work which could be age related so the next thing that I want to sort of show you is that this is the power switch and then you can see right next to it is the fuse protection and there's normally a plastic cover on there and you can see where the blue and brown wires are going off to the toroidal and then what I've done is I've just circled around there there is a resistor and you can see that there is a two pin flying lead that comes off the main amp board and then just to the right of that power resistor you can see there's another plug-in connector and what that does is it connects to the LED which protrudes through the front fascia so if we zoom in a little bit closer you can see the resistor here marked R301 and all that it does is current will pass through the resistor and then you will have a volt drop and then that volt drop equals the required voltage to operate the front panel LED. Now you have three fixing screws and once you remove them what you can do is you can turn that circuit board over and what I've done here is I've just put two circles around two bad solder joints which are on that dropping resistor and what has happened is because the resistor is dissipating heat just over time the solder has started to break down and then crack so what you do is you just reflow it so once that work was done the next thing to then look at is to do the alignment for the output stage of the amplifier and then what you can see here is an extract from the service manual and we're showing the right channel and it's very straightforward to do what you have with the Sanken transistors you don't have a separate emitter resistor on the circuit board or maybe test points what you have to do is you have to clip your multimeter leads across terminals S and E on the NPN SAP and what you're looking to measure here is 13 millivolts internally there is a 0.22 ohm emitter resistor but you don't physically see it within the packages of the transistors there are two devices so these are what we call Darlington transistors so deliver higher current for a smaller package and then you leave the amplifier running probably for about 15 20 minutes in a stable environment you don't want any draft and then what you can then do is you can make your adjustment and then what you can see here is on the initial test that the millivoltage is slightly high so it's coming in here nearly 16 millivolts what I would always advise you to do as well purchase these small little hook clips and then you can just go around the pins of the transistors make sure they're not touching and then I just plug in my multimeter probes and then I'm free then just to use my trimmer adjustment to pull it back to the required factory value and as you see here we're reading 13 millivolts if we look at the other channel that was slightly different so instead of being high it was a reverse so it was actually under so the output transistors were not running at their optimum and you can see here that it was just 10.43 millivolts 
difference. So again, as we saw on the previous example, all you simply do is you just make your adjustment and you're looking then to get to approximately 13 millivolts or thereabouts. It doesn't have to be bang on. So in terms of what the customer reported and what I actually found was the one channel was working, but because of the open circuit resistor and the high value resistor, then the other channel was not and there wasn't any audio coming through. But once the resistors were replaced, then you had audio then coming through on both. So in terms of sort of finalizing the repair, the amplifier then went through its normal full test. So typically it will run normally for about four hours. Everything was fine, you know, no issues or any sort of concern. So that really sort of brings us to the end of the tutorial. And as always, I really appreciate you stopping by. And if you have any questions or you need any further information, by all means, email audio amplifier servicing at AOL.com. And I'll be more than happy to come back to you and provide any guidance or support that you may require. So until the next time, I wish you all the very best. Cheers and bye bye.